information and resources that you need now. And our speakers have worked very hard to respond rapidly to the emerging issues in employment, labor, and workforce development to bring you important topics that you need now. So stay tuned to our workshop registrations. We have a number of webinar series that will continue to be developing and we'll be sending those out through email. Joining us today is Dr. Mallory Ray. She is with MUXC Community and Economic Development. Dr. Rob Russell, the Director of MU Extension Labor and Workforce. Joe Horner with MU Extension State He's a state specialist in dairy and beef. Jacob Halston is with us. He is with the Southeast Missouri, Missouri Small Business Development Center. Chad Bruner with the Department of Economic Development and Paul Gerald with Smart Space from Poplar Bluff. Mallory, I look forward to your presentation and uh, we'll turn the floor over to you to get started. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Amy. Uh, happy to be here. So I just want to go over a few um, metrics and give you a broad overview of some trends in uh, rural Missouri since the last recession and to talk about what we might see going forward. So here's some of the big takeaways. Missouri is a slow growth state across multiple metrics. On average, rural areas of the state grow more slowly than urban. I'm gonna talk a lot about rural averages and urban averages, but I just want you to know that there's a lot of um, differences among those averages, but we simply don't have time to go into all of those today. But we should think about the growth in urban and rural areas as being related. Some of the slow growth we see in rural areas, we can attribute to the slow growth happening in the urban areas of our state. When we look in Missouri, several parts of the rural, um, rural areas of our state have not recovered from the Great Recession. These places still have fewer jobs and they're smaller economies than they used to be. And when we talk about rural development, we often want to highlight entrepreneurship and the ability to develop local talent and resources as strong strategies. Whoops. So first let's look at GDP or gross domestic product. This is the value of all goods and services produced and we're looking at the time period from 2009 to 2018. Missouri is this gold bar here at the bottom. You can see see that we lag the US, the, the black line, and a lot of Midwestern states. So our economy has only grown 7% since 2009. However, the rate of growth started to increase in 2016. So we were on an upward trend uh, recently. If we pull apart GDP for rural and urban areas in the US and Missouri, we can see that GDP growth lags in rural areas, um, especially here beginning in 2014, we see a break in rural areas of the US compared to urban and same in Missouri. What's also concerning is that over time, this is 2009 to 18 again, the discrepancy in this growth this cumulative growth rate between the US and Missouri is troubling. So the GDP measures all parts of the economy. If we stop and take a look at employment, and here I'm using the quarterly, um, the quarterly census of employment and wages. This covers 95% of all US jobs that are covered by the unemployment insurance program. So this data does exclude self-employed workers, military, railroad, and it covers about half the jobs in agriculture. But this is a nice quarterly metric to track. And if we look at growth, annual growth rates from 2009 to 2018, the white areas of the state are our metropolitan or urban counties. They have a population of more than 50,000 people or 25% or more of their workforce commutes to an urban area. Over this time period, 90% of the state's total net job growth occurred in these urban counties, especially in those darkest green counties. But you can see that not all of our urban areas experienced growth. 
dark blue counties on average had negative annual growth rate over this time period. And 59 counties in Missouri had fewer jobs in 2018 than they did in 2009. 47 of these 59 are rural counties. So what explains this declining growth? Some of it is the size of the labor force. Um, this is the number of people who are both employed and unemployed who are seeking work. The US is the black line there on top. From 2011 to 2019, the size of the labor force has grown in the US, but weakly. So if you look at Missouri in red, our labor force is nearly the same size uh, today as it was in 2011, and I should say 2019, not today. Um, so urban areas uh, have done better. The gold line on the bottom represents the size of the labor force in non-metropolitan slash rural Missouri. This labor force is actually smaller than it was in 2011. So what explains this declining size? Lots of things. We've got changing demographics. Our rural populations are usually older on that average. People are having smaller families and young people often leave to go to college or get a job. Rural areas also have lower educational attainment, which makes it harder for workers to adapt and less of the critical infrastructure that supports workers like public transportation, healthcare, childcare. Furthermore, we've got structural change happening in urban and rural economies that are leading more people to choose to, to drop out of the workforce. And, and they're doing that um, for a wide variety of reasons. So let's switch to talk about total population. The Great Recession was really hard on rural America. People typically tend to migrate from rural areas to urban areas during economic recessions in search of more job opportunities. The duration and depth of the Great Recession led to the first period of population loss for rural America between 2010 and 2016. So we came close to this in 1987. Uh, we came close to zero growth, but we had never before experienced negative growth in our rural areas. We started to rebound a little bit in 2017, and we know historically during periods of growing economic prosperity, people start to move back to rural areas. That was very clear in the GDP graphs I showed you a few minutes ago, where just recently, um, both rural and urban parts of our state were starting to rebound and grow faster. So let's look at just Missouri. Slow population growth does help explain um, slow growth in our labor force, uh, jobs, and our GDP. And population growth has three big components. The blue part of these bars represents natural increase. This is births minus deaths. That's been positive, and it accounts for the largest change in the total number of people for our state. Green is net international migration. This has also been positive from 2010 to 2018. More people from abroad are choosing to come to Missouri than the number of people who are choosing to move from Missouri to outside the US. But red is net domestic migration, and this has been negative. Of the people who move from one place in the US to another place in the US, more people are moving out of Missouri than the number of people who choose to move in. And I want you to think back to that GDP growth chart again. Right after the recession ended, when our economy was really struggling, we saw, we see in this chart here, larger red bars, more people choosing to leave the state likely for more economic opportunities. As our economy started to strengthen in 2016, we saw that decline, although it still remained negative. The state wasn't growing strongly enough to start being a net importer of um, people moving around the US. So this is the same graph for rural Missouri. And you can immediately see um, that this, here's the negative population change. So 
we've had year over year population declines from 2010 to 2018. The time period 2016 to 2017, we almost broke even. And again, we saw in the GDP graph, that's when the economy started to do better. Blue bars, natural increase was driving growth in our urban areas. Here, rural areas in our state have nearly equal births and deaths. We still see in green positive but smaller numbers of net inter international migration. And we have that trend of far more people moving out of rural Missouri to another region in the US than the number of people moving in, in the red bars. And you can see in our rural areas, this was sort of, this trend was increasing up until 2014 to 2015 was our worst year of losing net domestic migrants. And then we were starting to improve. Educational attainment is really important when we think about workforce development and economic development. Here's a statewide map. The urban areas are outlined in black. And you can see that many parts of our urban areas have equal educational attainment rates or higher than the US average. This is signified by that darkest blue color. And this is looking at the percent of the population that has an associate's degree or higher, while several rural regions in the state have significantly lower rates of educational attainment. These are the counties in the light blue or the white. So I want to step back and talk for a minute about the future of places and their path for development. And we really need to consider changes in the population and overall output GDP simultaneously. So that's what this graph does. It looks at, um, gives you the nation view and, and the view of Missouri from 2009 to 2018, what's happened to GDP and population? Red areas have seen a decline in both the overall size of the economy and the population, while blue areas are growing their economy and their population. Again, if we look at Missouri, most of our areas of strongest growth have been in urban counties or along interstate highways. Rural and urban counties, again, shouldn't be seen in isolation though. Um, we expect rural economies to export to urban economies, um, and the closer they are located to strong, thriving urban markets, the lower the transportation cost and transaction cost. It's easier for those rural firms to find a consumer and respond to changing demand. Northern Missouri stands out in our state and the broader region as an area of population and GDP decline in the red. And while many of the urban counties are growing, not all of them are, uh, including the heart of the St. Louis metro area, which is concerning because as our largest urban area, we really want a strong St. Louis to have very, to have as strong positive spillover benefits for our region as possible and to support, create strong markets for firms outside of the region. I just want to wrap up with a few thoughts on rural economic development trends. This is kind of something that we've been observing for a long time. We know that areas with better natural amenities and those that are closer to urban areas will likely grow faster, all else equal. Um, but as you saw with population, rural areas are dependent on positive net migration. Uh, commonly people migrate um, during a recession from rural areas to urban. Uh, this pandemic is different. It's hard to say how this event will change where people want to live and how they will realign preferences for jobs, lifestyles, and proximity to family. It's also unclear how employers will adapt and be flexible and how fast that change will come. Uh, you know, how much will tele teleworking increase? But in Missouri, we know we have weaker broadband access throughout the state, and this will continue to be a barrier. As communities think about attracting people to move in, they may be most successful trying to attract people who grew up in an area but left to return over others who might come in. And this is to build on family and social networks and sense of place. We've seen a decline in state and federal investment in economic development for a long time. And there's been this growing recognition that rural areas need to look internally for solutions that are adapted to their local needs and their 
capacity. And this suggests putting more resources into entrepreneurship, business retention and expansion, and targeted workforce development efforts that are responsive to local industries. It also means we need to see the economy and the society as an interrelated system. It's important to make investments that will keep people and businesses in the community. So infrastructure like broadband, childcare and schools and public spaces and civic organizations that build community connections and that sense of place. And there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over. All right, thank you, Mallory. <clears throat> And this is Rob. Amy, have you switched over so I have control? I'm looking for your name. So sorry. Not a problem here. Um, and I'll be uh, presenting here with Joe Horner and I will be, uh, be sharing this, but we are picking up on what Mallory said. One of the things that's fascinating and, and frankly scary about the time that we're in right now is that there's, there's the trends that we've been looking at for the last decade, the last 20 years in terms of, in terms of the state of Missouri and nationally. Um, but this COVID-19 crisis is, is changing a lot of that too, and has changed that to speed, the, the depth that we're looking at here. And so Joe and I have been talking a lot about how do, how do we help parts of rural Missouri and particularly farms and agribusinesses prepare for COVID-19 uh, and, and make sure that they are looking at the resources that are out there and the resources that are available um, to help them, help them uh, in, their ag in the agricultural space here. So a few things just to, to point out here and see if I can get this to control here and move. There we are. So a couple of things. First of all, as we look at COVID-19 in the state of Missouri, a, a few things stand out. Uh, most of the cases we know this are in urban areas. The actual, you know, St. Louis County um, out of the, this is yesterday's numbers, 4,600 cases, a little bit over, almost 4,700 cases in Missouri. 1,851 of those are in St. Louis County. You throw in St. Louis City, which has another 700 cases, St. Charles County, which is nearly 400 cases, that the, the outbreak in Missouri is concentrated in urban areas. If you throw in the Kansas, Kansas side of Kansas City, <clears throat> the same thing is happening there. Um, but that does not mean that these cases are confined to urban areas, nor does it mean that rural areas should not be paying attention to what's going, going on out there. And there's a great, oops, went back here. There's a great, um, set of data coming from a sociologist at St. Louis University named Chris Printer, who's looking at confirm, uh, looking at COVID-19 data and what's going on and looking at infection rates by county. So the raw numbers we know are highest in our urban areas. But if we look at counties that have highest rates of infection, right now, according to yesterday's data, St. Louis City has the highest rate of infection there, but followed very closely by Perry County here in Southeast Missouri. Uh, in the last week since Joe and I did this another time, Saline County over here in West Central Missouri has popped up very highly and that the, the infection rate that is going on there is amongst the highest in the state uh, that, that we're seeing here. So this is not just an urban problem. It's something that we know is, is uh, spreading throughout rural areas. There's a number of stories uh, in the last week or so <clears throat> of packing plants that are being affected by this and other agribusinesses that are being affected by this where uh, employees are, are getting uh, are, are, are contracting COVID-19, testing positive, and the plants are having to shut down. So we know that this is an increasing concern for all parts of the state, and it's not just a, an urban uh, and suburban uh, issue. So a couple of things that we are, we're talking to folks and, and, and agribusiness and, and farms and other places like that to do if they can. Uh, first of all, it's educating their employees about COVID-19 and encouraging them to stay at home if they are ill. Uh, it's, it's possible for employers to send sick, home, sick employees home. Um, if you have sick employees or you feel like you're sick, we're encouraging folks to contact medical professionals for things such as fever, cough, or difficulty breathing, but also making sure that you do call ahead so that the provider may take extra precautions. Uh, hospitals are on uh, lockdown for the most part around the state and around the country, uh, limiting access. And so they, the call ahead is a very important part of that so that they can ensure that, the, that they are set up and able to take anybody that's coming in there. Uh, we're also encouraging employers to update their policies to address employees who are sick due to COVID-19. Uh, for covered employers, the, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act expanded Family and Medical Leave Act coverage, as well as paid sick leave for those, uh, for those employees, and it provides tax credits for employers who are infected by this also. 
The second thing we're encouraging in, in the agribusiness space and across the, across the board is to practice social distancing. Uh, maintaining a six foot distance between employees if possible is encouraged there. Um, if you can do it and, and it's, it's capable, telework and remote work is, is, is a great uh, avenue. I've heard stories of people figuring out how to use their phones as hotspots and things like that in areas where broadband coverage is limited uh, and employers working in those areas to help, help their employees get coverage there. Uh, limiting large group gatherings and staggering the start and end of shifts is, a very, is, a, is an important CDC recommendation for employers to help limit the spread amongst your workforce if it does get into your workforce. Uh, if possible, helping your workforce break into smaller groups, keeping them separate during times there so that they're they are performing different tasks will help you uh, limit the spread amongst, uh, amongst the workforce there. Um, limiting travel is also, and restricting unnecessary travel is a key part of this. Uh, one of the things that I've seen a lot of places do is that if people do have to travel for work, that there are limits on who is allowed to travel and who is not allowed to travel. And finally, providing adequate safety me measures when social distancing is not possible. That can include the uh, provision of personal protective equipment or as the picture you see here uh, demonstrates uh, where a lot of supermarkets have actually installed plexiglass between their, um, between their checkers and the customer to provide that little bit of a barrier to try and limit the uh, spread of, of COVID-19 particles. Practicing good hygiene and biosecurity is also strongly encouraged here. That includes providing adequate hand washing facilities and cleaning breaks for your employees. One of the, the best way that, that the CDC has recommended to tackle this is through hand washing and regular hand washing. So for employers uh, across the state, but particularly in agribusiness and, and on farms, providing some additional hand washing facilities and time is recommended there. Hand sanitizer, if, if you can't provide other hand washing is also recommended as a part of this. Um, also regularly cleaning and disinfecting the workplace, including the equipment that is used there is, is strongly encouraged. <clears throat> we encourage in businesses to set a cleaning schedule, uh, look up and ad abide by the CDC and EPA guidelines for cleaning and cleaning products. They have that online and they will tell you which products you should be using, how you should be using them um, so that you can clean your workplace. And again, shared equipment is the most important part of cleaning it, but the entire workplace is important here. And making sure that employees that are safe when cleaning also does matter because you're working with, with chemicals <clears throat> in ways that could provide could also create other dangerous situations. So making sure you're doing safe cleaning is, is key here. Um, one of the things that they are recommending is that if you are not able to clean an area and keep it clean on a regular basis, that it should be closed to group gatherings and large, group, uh, large groups of employees to keep that spread from happening. Finally, one of the things for all employers uh, that they should be thinking about is a workforce staffing and contingency plan. Um, prepare assuming that COVID-19 will come into your operation, I think is the best advice you can have. So assume you're going to get it and operate with that assumption um, to think about what you would do in that scenario here. A couple of things that you need to be focusing on is identifying essential jobs and functions within your workplace there, within your agribusiness or your, your farm, and figure out how you're going to fill those roles if parts of your employment, uh, parts of your uh, workforce are not able to come to work because of, because of this illness here. Uh, that can include cross-training employees, as well as dividing your team, your workforce into smaller teams, and then keeping those teams isolated in order to limit disruption from a quarantine. If you can have, a, have small groups that are working in your workplace and one of those groups gets infected, as long as you, if you keep them isolated from the other two or three groups, then you can keep those other groups working there. There are a number of resources available from the CDC and, uh, and OSHA. Let's see if I can get, get forward here. Uh, OSHA has two, uh, has two different guide sheets that are out there that are publicly available. One's a guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19. This is a longer document, gets into more depth, but they've also developed a 10 point uh, safety li a list of uh, all steps, steps that all workplaces can take to reduce the risk of exposure to coronavirus. Uh, Amy will have these links available, I think for you also, and the recording for those here. Joe, I think it's on to you now. Hey, thank you, Rob. Um, a lot of things that I'm going to go over are very similar to what Rob talked about from the agribusiness angle. I'm just going to share a little bit about the look from a farmer's perspective of what it looks like to be going through this epidemic. And everybody has seen the, the map that John Hopkins has put up with where the infection rates are. 
the one thing I'll bring to everybody's attention is something Rob pointed out. We've got this all over the Midwest. It is in our local community. And if it doesn't show up directly on your farm, and we hope it doesn't, and we think uh, farmers are in pretty good shape to self-isolate, it, it could still affect you because of the supply chain issues that we're starting to see crop up uh, in a lot of places. And if I can advance, there we go. One thing that uh, I would bring up is for the Missouri specific map of, of when we're gonna hit the maximum of the epidemic, we've, we've advanced a week uh, in the last week. So we're, we're up to hitting our peak in Missouri sometime the last week of April. And what that means is we're gonna be hitting the peak epidemic in Missouri at about the same time as we're burning diesel uh, on farms the fastest. We've got about 10 million acres to plant during this epidemic. Uh, there's a, if you look at the USDA estimates of uh, planting intentions, we're gonna be planting about 3.6 million acres of corn, about 5.8 million acres of soybeans. 400,000 acres of cotton, 200,000 acres of rice, in addition to tending the normal 2 million beef cows, 3.5 million hogs, 300 million chickens, and 75,000 milk cows. Now we'll do it and do it without drama, just like every business out there will, will do this. But the point is for ag, there's an avalanche of information out here on how to deal with COVID-19 from a farm management, from a food processing standpoint, from an agribusiness standpoint. But a lot of producers are absolutely working 16 hour days for the next 60 days and may not be able to spend a lot of time going into the details of some of the, the recommendations. So we put together a simple little graphic that just tried to convince farmers to take one quick look at it and look through their farming operation and see if they're prepared, if there's anything they can do to increase resiliency on their farms with three simple steps. Number one, protect people's health. We've all heard it, maintain six foot distances, wash hands, stay home if ill. Plan for sickness, as Rob said, segregate your teams. A lot of farmers will say, well, I don't really have a lot of employees or teams, but they do. They're calling on grandma and grandpa to run for parts or to drive tractors and move equipment. They're calling on junior home from college. They're calling on high school kids to help with things and brothers and sisters that all farm together and may eat, normally eat dinner at the same place. If we can segregate those teams and if one member of the family gets sick, we don't take down the whole farming operation. So expect uh, disruptions, expect illness, clean or close your, your break room, showers, uh, common areas. If you can't clean them on a regular basis and sanitize between use, consider closing them. And for a piece of equipment, when you climb in and out of cab, take shifts, uh, use some Lysol and some sanitizer so that we don't share uh, vectors of disease. Farmers are used to dealing with a lot of biosecurity issues on their farm. They just have to think in terms of keeping a closed herd, uh, but not dealing with uh, livestock, dealing with people and all the things they're used to in, in biosecurity. We've got a plan for business succession. Uh, a lot of farms operate with fairly informal system with one person writing checks. Um, somebody has to be there if that person gets ill. Suppliers, contingency plan. Rob mentioned the contingency. What we're seeing right now, and it's really come in this last week of a lot of marketing uh, disruption. We've heard about the Smithfield plant in Sioux Falls, South Dakota going down. Tyson's plant in Columbus Junction, Iowa has gone down. Together, those two plants are about 6% of the kill uh, on hogs in the US. JBS has got a big cattle plant in Greeley, Colorado that's gone down for deep cleaning. Um, and Rob mentioned the Saline County uh, processing plant was kind of a center of some of the infection rates there. So we've got some risk there. When we start backing up marketing, we back up uh, hogs on farms, we back up cattle. It's easier to back up cattle we can grow cattle on grass fat longer before we put them in feedlots. But when you've got a market hog ready to go, it can be very disruptive to cash markets and farmers need to be thinking about that. So with that simple graphic, we've tried to get people to thinking about it. 
Um, and uh, I'm not seeing it be advancing right now. There we go. And what we've convinced farmers to do is just think about things they can control. There's a huge amount of information right now. There's this absolute avalanche of information. Think about what they can control. Biosecurity is number one, keeping your people healthy. Then production, because uh, they've got a limited number of time to get the acres in to take care of their farm. With any remaining time they've got, think through the business aspects of it. And it is time to play defense. We are moving into recession. We do have declining uh, values on most ag products right now. Cash markets are pretty sloppy in the livestock sector. So watch your cash flow, very important. Use unemployment of your employees if you, you're not using them right now. Use your supplier credit lines to the degree you can. Don't necessarily take the, the cash discounts. Go ahead and, and keep your working capital as tight as you can. Add to liquidity wherever you can. Uh, secure a PPP loan. Rob's gonna talk a little bit about that. Know your numbers so you can work with lenders. Know your credit limits. Um, and just assume that markets are gonna get chaotic. Uh, we're gonna have to stay flexible in marketing. We're gonna have to plan for plant closings. Um, and realistically, we're gonna have to plan for counterparty failures. There's a lot of small business people in rural areas. We do things fairly informal. And uh, some of the folks that you've done business with for years uh, are gonna have a really tough time in this environment. So just plan on your contractual arrangements with people being a little more formal with those and not getting too far out on accounts receivable. Finally, I just finished with the last slide when it advances. Um, one thing that this whole episode has taught us is that the uh, essential employees in the farming and food sector processing, everybody understands how essential those people are when you get to the grocery store and the shelves are empty. And I think we're gonna get through this. I think everybody's figured it out. I don't think anybody's panicking, but um, it does remind you how important uh, food production and processing is. And uh, I think we can all take pride in that. With that, I'll, Amy, I'll turn it back to whoever's next. Who's up next? It's, it's me, Joe, for the finish off the programs here real quick. Gotcha. All right. So let me, let me advance here quickly. Uh, a couple of things, and, and, and Jacob and some, and some of the others could speak to this also here, but a couple of other things that we wanted to uh, just highlight for, for businesses around the state that, we, that Joe and I have been talking about, and th these are open to farmers and other agribusiness. Some of the programs are, some are not. Um, but a couple of things that they should be contemplating here. First of all, is the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, this was part of the CARES Act. It's open to farmers and agribusiness enterprises of fewer than 500 employees. And these provide loans uh, up to two times your average monthly payroll cost from the past year, plus 25% to cover additional costs. Uh, these are forgivable loans that can be used to cover payroll costs. Most mortgage insurance, rent and utility costs over the eight week period after the loan is made, as long as uh, employee compensation levels are maintained. So it's a forgivable loan for folks. These are available through private lenders. Uh, I will say they are going quickly is my understanding right now. I think the last numbers I read, uh, $350 billion have been appropriated to this and there were $300 billion of commitments or so. So if you're, if you're in a small business or a small business that is, uh, hasn't gone into this space yet, uh, then they should be uh, submitting their application as soon as possible. Uh, one of the keys is making sure you have your paperwork in order, have your, have your financials and that sort of information to help you through the process. There's also economic injury disaster loans available, open to agribusiness enterprises, but not farms at least yet. Uh, one of the key distinctions I saw here was great from, uh, was a great distinction made by, <clears throat> by great, great growers and wineries here, that if you operate a winery, uh, they would be eligible for um, an idle loan, an economic injury disaster loan. But if you're a vineyard, you would not be eligible for it there. So it depends on how your business is set up and what your role is. Um, but there are um, advances available as a part of this, plus a loan of up to $2 million. There's been some, a lot of information out there about how much the loans are going out in this uh, area for. Um, but these are for expenses that could have been met if not for the disaster and come at a low interest rate. Uh, these loans are available through the Small Business Administration. 
Uh, there are a lot of unemployment insurance changes and options that are coming up right now too. Um, so for the, and one of the areas that I've been getting a lot of questions on, particularly as it relates to agribusiness and other areas is, is for folks <clears throat> that have been paid um, on a cash basis and other basis like that, um, what, they're, what they're eligible for. Uh, if you're eligible for traditional unemployment insurance, one change that has been made is that the one week waiting requirement for benefits uh, has been waived as well as the changes to contributions for employers that make due, uh, that are made due to benefits paid as a result of COVID-19. Uh, one, another program that is opening up uh, as we speak early next week here is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. This is a program that's for individuals not eligible for regular or extended benefits um, for unemployment insurance, including independent contractors, self-employed, some agricultural workers. Uh, the program and guidelines are still being set up in Missouri, but it's anticipated to open next week. In fact, the Missouri Department of Labor sent out a press release today that they anticipate uh, starting to fill those claims starting April 19th. There's information on their website about what and what people will need to submit for their proof of earnings uh, and, and the process for it there. They're, they are telling us though that um, anybody applying for an, uh, unemployment compensation under this program will probably need to be, you know, will need to be um, deemed and determined ineligible for regular unemployment. So they are encouraging you to go ahead and your employees to go ahead and file for unemployment right now and to get a determination of whether or not you are eligible for the um, for traditional unemployment or the pandemic program there. A few other things, uh, there's additional federal additional compensation of $600 a week in benefits that is open to both people under traditional unemployment insurance as well as under pandemic unemployment assistance. That started going out this week here and it's retroactive to March 29th. Uh, and then Missouri Department of Labor also participates in shared work programs. These are programs that are alternatives to layoffs uh, that allows employers to spread reduced work over their workforce and their employees then to receive unemployment compensation for the reduced hours. Employers have to participate, apply to, a, to participate in this program, um, but it is a program that is available. So say like your workload has gone down to 75% of the normal amount there. Um, if it's that, that amount, then employees, you can apply for the shared work program assuming you meet other criteria and are determined eligible, then your employees would receive uh, compensation from you for 75% of the their regular wage. And then the other 25% would be items that would be eligible um, for unemployment compensation there. Uh, we have our emails and things like that, but it's something again that this is, you know, as we're thinking about rural Missouri and particularly farm and agribusiness, some of these areas are areas that they have not, uh, that a lot of haven't, hasn't been open, for example, some of the loan programs that, that we were talking about through SBA haven't traditionally been open to, to farmers and other agribusiness entities. There's a lot more openings now that, than there have been. I'm sure Jacob will talk about this here, but looking at what those resources are to help your business is going to be key. One final resource that I'll, I will start talking about, and I'm sure Jacob and others will, uh, MissouriSBDC.org is the, the centralized location for the Small Business Development Centers in Missouri and they are doing a centralized intake. So any questions that you have related to a lot of these programs, they can answer and they will provide uh, and they will direct you to resources that are there to help address some of these questions. Thank you. All right, I take it that uh, I may be up uh, for the next, is that correct? You're correct. Good, good, good. Just want to make sure I'm not jumping on anyone else's uh, part here. So my name is Jacob Pallison. I work with the Small Business Development Center. I'm the director of the CMO SBDC. So what I'd like to spend the next five, 10 minutes on is just sharing a little bit about what we do and kind of what we've seen uh, and diving in a little bit about collaboration and partnerships. Um, so it's going to be both what we do on a normal basis outside of um, crisis and coronavirus situations, uh, but still with an emphasis on what we've been doing in the last few weeks. So I think most people are probably familiar with SBDC or heard about us, uh, but just to make sure everyone is on the same page, uh, our main focus is really that one-on-one, -on -one, no cost, confidential business consulting and resources for small businesses, um, so startups and up to 500 employees. My center covers 19 counties. There's myself, there's a graduate assistant, and hopefully we will be able to rehire another full-time uh, counselor. But right now we are surviving on partnerships and collaboration to reach all of those small businesses in our region. 
especially considering that we're all stuck at home working uh, using Zoom and email and phone. So obviously the big focus for us in the last couple of weeks has been the PPP and the Idle Paycheck Protection Program and Economic Injury Disaster Loan. That's what everyone's been wanting to know about. Uh, so Rob, thank you for doing a good overview of that. Um, a quick update on kind of what that looks like on the PPP loan. Um, the last number I saw was in Missouri, there were 34,000 approved. And I think that's actually a couple of days ago. So we're assuming several more. That amounts to $6.4 million in PPP funds that are, uh, have been approved. Um, not all of it may have been dispersed yet, but we do know some of it has. And just for reference, that's actually 2.5% of the total amount approved in the US, which is pretty good considering that the state of Missouri, as far as I know, is about 1.9% in population. So we're a little bit ahead on those uh, compared to some of the other states. Um, our focus in the last couple of weeks have been talking to, I think I've counted 60 uh, businesses that I've directly personally provided assistance to, explaining the programs, helping them apply, helping them understand what the requirements are, even though there's been a lot of confusion on it and, and there's still some answers that we're trying to clarify. Um, that's been directly what I've been doing. Um, as of this morning, I have verified $419,200 in PPP loans that have actually been dispersed, not just approved. So it is definitely getting out there this week to the small businesses. Um, and I was also very excited to have my first uh, business client that said that they actually got the EIDL advance as well this morning. Uh, if you talk to any business owners that have applied, a lot of them have been saying, I haven't gotten any updates, um, what's going on and, and am I getting any money? Uh, so it's good to hear that that's actually happening right now. So um, let me take a quick sip. Our main focus in the last couple of weeks has really been primarily on talking to those business clients, but we've also been trying to just do some general information sharing and connecting with our partners and resources. Um, you're going to hear a little bit from Paul with Smart Space uh, after me, but we did a Facebook Live webinar last week to talk about these programs to help get the word out there. We've been hosting um, weekly EIDL and PPP update and Q&A sessions with our stakeholders. Um, so one of the things that we found to be most effective is instead of me trying to talk to 200 business owners, which I don't have the time for the resources for. Um, it's a lot easier if we connect with our stakeholders, our partners, uh, and those people that are on the ground in the different communities. So we've been hosting those. Uh, we're going to do another one this week. Very informal way for us to get the chambers, the economic developers, uh, lenders, and whoever else is willing to jump on board for 30, 40 minutes and just kind of give a quick update on what's actually going on. Um, we've also been presenting or we will be presenting a business disaster recovery resources uh, workshop with our uh, mornings with merchants group uh, through Old Town Cape. So really all of that is just to say that we're trying to connect with all the different groups that are in our region uh, that have direct access to their businesses um, in their communities, in their groups and offering our time and our insights and our knowledge to make sure that the information gets out there uh, as quickly as possible. So looking at the big picture with SBDC, um, again, I think most people are familiar that there's a lot more to SBDC than just me. Uh, so we are a statewide network and that has certainly been one of the most valuable pieces uh, in the response to this. We have our website, uh, MissouriSBDC.org. You can go on there and get a lot of updated and, and the most recent information. But the reality is when someone comes to me and says, Jacob, I'm in this kind of business and I need some help, what do I do? There's a good chance that I personally won't have the best answer or the right experience or knowledge to really provide uh, in-depth counseling on every single issue. Um, I have not experienced anything like this. Um, few people have, fortunately, but still some have been around longer than I have, and, and they have more experience in certain industries uh, and going through economic downturns. So what we do is we use our internal communication platform. We use Zoom, we use email, phone, and all the, the regular stuff to connect with each other and get those counselors with the right experience to the right businesses. So no one relies on just the counselor in their region. Uh, and that has been tremendously valuable to some of those businesses that we work with. Um, so 
The last thing I really wanted to touch on um, is kind of some of those specific tools and resources. Normally I would do a whole show and tell, uh, but they tend to take a little bit of extra time to really dive into. What I really want to make sure everyone understands is that we have some phenomenal tools and resources. Um, one is called Growth Wheel. Uh, that's a fairly new one. It's really a business assessment and focus tool that we're using with clients right now to say, you may be sitting at home uh, without getting a lot of revenue and yeah, you need to take care of some financials, but let's also figure out what do you do from a strategic standpoint to keep your business floating and growing your business once we get back to a growing economy. Uh, so there's a fantastic tool that we have access to that we use with a lot of our clients. It's called Growth Wheel. Then there's Business Model Canvas. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen or heard about that. So we're using that to help these businesses understand that the business model they're in today may not be the one that they should be in or need to be in uh, in the future. This is you know, a time to recognize that the business models of last year may need to change a little bit uh, to survive and to thrive in this economy in the future. So we're using that a lot to help them understand that part of it. We have access to financial assessment uh, tools so we can go in and look at your financial performance and start uh, analyzing and understanding where were you at and where are you going? Uh, and what is that going to look like if you want to stay financially healthy? And then the last one I wanted to mention is called Vertical IQ. Uh, it's an industry research platform that we can pull um, a lot of the latest trends in industry and market to help the local businesses understand what's happening in the world around them uh, beyond just Southeast Missouri or Missouri in general. Um, if there's a good trend somewhere else, there's a good chance that a local business can benefit from that here. So the last thing I wanted to touch on, um, and I think it's already been brought up a little bit, but you know, in, in times like these, we're certainly seeing, you know, the businesses that have taken care of financials, uh, that have saved a lot of money, that had a plan B and C and D, uh, and those are the businesses that tend to be doing okay right now. Then there are a lot of businesses who didn't do those things for good reason. They were busy running a business. But this, I think, teaches us, again, that planning for challenging times is a good idea when you're in good times. So we're going to be diving deeper into financial record keeping and helping our businesses understand, you know, how to manage their financials better, how to save essentially, uh, and how to think long term and how to have better strategic plans uh, that go beyond just, you know, good times. So that's our general overview. I didn't really want to get too far into what we do with our partners uh, like Shad Berner and Paul, because I think they're going to share a little bit about how we collaborate uh, specifically on, on some of these things. So is it Paul or Shad that's up next? Well, it looks like it's me. <laughs> All righty. So, uh, like Jacob said, my name is Paul Gerald. I'm a co-founder of Smart Space at Poplar Bluff, uh, and I'm also uh, part owner and general manager for Smart Marketing uh, here in Poplar Bluff as well. So, uh, just a little brief history. Smart Space is actually a nonprofit. Uh, we are a business incubator, a nonprofit business incubator, um, similar to a co-working space is the best description for us. So. Um, behind me, you can see I'm in my office. Um, I'm a living example of what Mallory said in the very beginning is that Missouri struggles with broadband and I struggle with broadband in my home in Van Buren. So my office here in Pulper Bluff is where I come to do webinars and things of that nature. So um, Smart Space is a co-working space. We have about 5,000 square feet behind me and about 12 or to 14 private offices, I think. People come in and rent those and, and do it. And we have all kinds of different clients. We have, um, we have architect that works here. We have um, a lawyer that works here. We've actually had a couple of lawyers, different lawyers work in here. Um, business and the, the one that works here currently is a family lawyer. Um, we have a project management company, a construction management company that works out of our office. Um, and then my company, Smart Marketing, works here. So um, this all came about uh, a couple of years ago when, uh, um, actually about five, six years ago, actually 2014, 
Um, we were working remotely, working from home before it was cool. And we were in a meeting just like this, a Zoom meeting. Um, and I was trying to get some things done. And the two people I was working with, they were getting distracted. And they were getting very easily distracted. And I said, okay, fine. We have to have an office. And so we started looking at office space and realized that office space is, you know, expensive, especially for a very startup company like Smart Marketing was at the time. Um, we started looking around and, you know, Codify had just started over in Cape Girardeau. And so we kind of looked at Codify um, and then we reached out to some community partners of ours, uh, Papa Wolf Chamber, um, their president, Steve Halter, and our local regional planning commission. Uh, we reached out to the director of that, Felicity Ray, um, and we just set a meeting. We came over and we talked with James Stapleton there at the uh, at Codify. And kind of he walked through his process of why they were a for-profit um, and talked about what they were doing and things of that nature. So we came back, put some pen, pen to paper uh, and realized that, you know, if we wanted to make this thing successful, as successful as possible, um, it's probably in the best interest to go nonprofit for us. We weren't really looking for a profit. We were looking more as, hey, we need an office space that's affordable, um, but we also want to be a community resource. And uh, we opened in 2017. Um, and we've been doing pretty well since then. Uh, we have struck up a lot of community partners. Um, I talked about with the Chamber of Commerce there, SEMO University, Jacob Paulson and the Small Business Development Center. Um, they've been great allies of ours since before we opened. We were able to be in talks with them um, and announce them as a sponsor the, the, day we, the day we opened up and we had a ribbon cutting. So um, that was something that's really great to have. Um, these community partners that we can reach out Jacob mentioned that we recently held a um, Facebook Live for the PPP and EIDL, um, mainly because I don't know a lot about that stuff. And, you know, I had questions about it and I knew Jacob had been dealing with it. And so I just asked him to come on there and we took questions from our Facebook Live audience, uh, much like a, a Zoom. We've, we had a nicer little audience on Facebook to reach out to. Um, and we hosted that and I think it ended up being about 45 minutes or an hour that Jacob and I talked about the PVP and the EIDL and some of the, some of the pros against it and, and, and some of the, you know, some of the more technical aspects of it. And then the questions people had, you know, there was several questions in the, in the chat about asking about sole proprietor and, and things of that nature. So, um, those are all partnerships that we've been able to, to formulate over the last three to four years. You know, we started this project in, in 2014, uh, into 2014 and 15. Um, and then, like I said, we opened in 2017. So it's been a labor of love for myself and my other co-founders um, who, you know, we turned it into a nonprofit just so we could provide a community resource. Um, one of the things we offer is, you know, very, very low rent. You know, we have our open space out there. It's $45 a month um, and people can come in and, and utilize it free print scan fax, um, free Wi-Fi. Like I said, we're in Popper Bluff. Um, it's it's a decent little little area here, but surrounded by a lot of ruralness in, in our area and, and even over in Van Buren, a lot of rural areas. So um, providing stable internet is what most of our clients come here for. Um, we've had clients that you know needed to get out of their old office or whatever, but it's really the reliable internet and the low cost that is drawing people in. Um, we use technology all the time to, to better work with our partners. Um, and we're seeing it really come into effect now. Um, the last several years I've worked with Jacob and several other people in our community, lawyers and financial advisors and things like that. And we hold these spring and fall series of webinars or they're actually, they, they haven't been webinars. They've been in person, in, in person trainings. Um, and so, you know, we've utilized technology like Zoom and Google Hangouts before um, on a personal level, but never a business level. And so obviously now everybody, everybody knows how to use Zoom and this has become quickly uh, very efficient at it. And so um, being able to host these, our spring series still, um, but do it as Facebook Lives or as webinars um, that we host through Eventbrite, you know, those are th things that are still very much um, in our capability. We, you know, it, it's very funny. We reinvested some money in smart space, um, in March to open up what we thought was the first podcasting room for co-working space. 
Um, so it would be available for clients to come in and, and use the podcasting room to, to get their message out and to get their branding out. Um, Smart Marketing, my company, has been doing podcasts in it and, well, now we're doing remote as well. Um, but, uh, it, you know, a lot, of, a lot of different businesses in the area could provide a, a really great service. Smart Marketing, my marketing company, um, we, we deal with a lot of service-based industries. And so we haven't really seen a dip in, in, in business, uh, for us, which has been very thankful. My, my crew, I've got five people on, uh, on staff full-time. Um, and we've been keeping very busy during this whole pandemic of, of getting the messaging out for our clients, um, and crafting those messages for them. So, um, smart space was able to, um, you know, was going to launch this new podcasting room um, March 15th, um, right before or right just after this stuff started. And so we kind of put a hold on that, but that's something we're very excited about. Um, and I know the, you know, Joe and Rob were talking about it earlier is um, being flexible with your capital and, and things of that nature. Um, we, as a nonprofit, we run on a very tight budget um, and we, we take sponsorships for, for, you know, projects like that. And the podcast room was a sponsorship uh, based deal to get that going. But, um, you know, on one of the podcasts we did not too long ago, it was talking about just being flexible during this time period. Um, you're seeing a lot with restaurants right now. They're being very flexible with, you know, ones that didn't want to deliver are now delivering ones that didn't want to do a lot of call in service or deliver or doing call in service. Um, a lot of restaurants in our area are even providing like family meals places like Colton's and, and things of that nature, steakhouses are doing these big family packs for, you know, 20 or $30 um, that'll feed a family for. So those things are just great to have and be flexible and, and, you know, just trying to keep, try to keep your employees going. So um, I think that's all I got really, you know, our, our website is smartspaceoffice.com. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them after the session. All right, so I guess that kicks it over to me. I'll jump in. Paul, thanks for the update. I'd pay $45 a month just to hang out with you guys personally. Um, and in a past life, I've done that. So um, my name is Shad Burner, and I work for the Missouri Department of Economic Development. And I am a, a manager over the Southeast region, which covers 25 counties um, from the east, from the Mississippi River to the southern border, all the way over just uh, west of West Plains. Um, and we have moved to a remote working status uh, recently, um, and, and my division is part of the engagement uh, division. So uh, my focus primarily is going out and working with companies that are looking to potentially expand, um, add jobs, and then working with communities, uh, however that is, to help facilitate economic growth in their community. When this crisis all started, we mobilized very quickly to get out and do a pulse check and find out what was happening in the communities um, all throughout the state of Missouri, not just in the Southeast region, of course. Um, what we learned was that uh, a lot of businesses needed capital and they needed it quickly. So as the CARES Act started to come, to come down, we um, very quickly started to team up with our SBDC partners uh, to figure out how to get that information out to those folks um, as efficiently as possible. And I think that Jacob and I, we, we've worked together a long time, uh, but we've become very um, a refuge. He's been a refuge for me in, in the last few weeks, and hopefully uh, he could say the same about me as well. Um, but uh, the PPP program and the EIDL were just so critical uh, for our companies that were struggling. And, and, and all the talks about expansion quickly um, went away for the most part. There's still a few um, and it definitely became more focused on how do I survive and how do I keep going? And those partnerships were critical. And we've uh, continued to lean on each other in that space. Um, as Jacob mentioned, we started doing a weekly call with our partners. Uh, Jacob is the information resource on that call. And, and hopefully I've, I've added some value in getting some additional community partners into the conversation uh, so that we can spread the word as quickly um, and correctly as possible. And that's really been our primary, primary focus and the way we've driven the partnerships over the last few weeks. As we move into the next phase of this, uh, there's a couple things to mention and talk about. Um, 
one is that we, we definitely see from an economic development standpoint that we need to be reaching out to these primary economic drivers, these major businesses throughout the community, uh, to see what's going on, see if there's any gaps in what they're finding funding for, and to see where we might need to plug in as a state um, to support that. Uh, the second part of that is the, that the CARES Act actually allocated quite a bit of money that's going to the states to be used um, to, to roll out to cities and uh, counties across the state. So one of the things we're doing and plan to continue to do uh, is to identify major hurdles that's happening in these communities. Um, of, of course, as the as revenue has declined, uh, as sales have declined for a lot of places, tax revenue has declined for um, communities. And so we are going to help try to roll up the information to understand how best to support our cities and our counties uh, with the funds that's coming out of the CARES Act from the federal government. So that's another piece of, of what we plan to start doing moving forward. So that's a really quick overview of, of the partnerships of how the state of Missouri Department of Economic Development is plugging into this. Um, and I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions or Jacob, if I've missed anything you think relevant, uh, just let me know. Thank you, I got Chad. no additions. You did a good job. Yeah, thank you. I had one question come in for Paul. And the question is, how have you been able to provide a reliable and dependable internet access in your office space? Uh, so luckily, um, our ISP um, here in Popper Bluff is New Wave. Um, we've had a great relationship and, and with them for several years. Um, but uh, we have, uh, we're kind of nerds <laughs> in our office. And so our, our Wi-Fi and, and our, our equipment here in the office is enterprise level, um, probably, you know, on par with the same stuff that SEMO University uses for, for their Wi-Fi. So um, we kind of had a leg up um, on that stuff. We have a lot of wireless devices. My marketing team that works here in the office always has, has never struggled with it. Um, and we, we off, we've offered that for some time. So we haven't had any power issues or, or internet issues um, in, during this pandemic at all. So uh, we've been kind of lucky there. And Paul, about how many clients do you have that are coming in on a weekly basis using the office? Uh, so my marketing company, which um, takes up three offices, I believe here in, in Smart Space, um, we're working remote, and so that's kind of a, a big share gone. Um, but of the other, I'm trying to think real fast. I do believe we have 14 private offices, um, uh, all of which are filled except for one. So we have 13 private offices. So um, we're still seeing traffic from all of them coming in on a weekly basis as well as our open membership is still, people are still coming in and utilizing that. Um, Smart Space is a 24 seven operation. Um, and so people come and go as they please and they always have come and go as they please. And so we haven't really seen a lot of a dip in activity here at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, a couple of our clients that use the space um, have high school kids um, who are, or college age kids who are now utilizing the open space um, to get homework done and things like that because the reason why they're at smart space is because their home internet is not conducive to a home office and so we're able to provide that service for them as well um, at no additional charge um, just to, to help out during this process so thank you Paul you're really providing an outstanding service in an extremely rural area and providing some resources in addition to the office space that your businesses can really need. That's a fabulous model and we appreciate you sharing that with us. I'm certain for the individuals on the call, if they have additional questions for Paul, that he'd be willing to answer them and provide information about his business model and how they've continued to develop that and respond to the needs of their businesses. I also saw that Jacob Paulson entered a chat that, um, the best way to connect with the SBDC is to, of course, reach out to him and go to mosbdc.org. I'll provide those resources or those links at the end and additional resources and handouts that the speakers have provided. And Jacob, we have an additional question for you. 
you spoke about the financial performance consulting that you do with businesses, the uh, backup plan or strategic planning for businesses to have an ABCD plan, um, a plan for long-term performance and helping businesses pivot when they transition back to work. Could you talk a little bit more about how they would access those services? Are those programs that are provided online? Are you doing webinars? I um, suspect that you're on remote right now and uh, if people want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that and how can they access those resources? So the, uh, let me answer the, the question of connecting. The, the far the best way to connect with me personally is with my email, jpallison at cmo.edu. Uh, and I put that in the chat box too. And, and, and Amy and anyone else that knows me, please feel free to share that, of course. That's by far the easiest because we're on phone, we're on Zoom, we're on all kinds of fun stuff all the time. So if someone tries to call, there's a about 75% chance that I won't pick up. Um, so all those resources, um, most of it are things that I work with directly with my clients. Um, so in all honesty, I think the most effective way for someone out there to get access to it is kind of through me, so to speak. Uh, again, it's at no cost, uh, but some of those are things that we subscribe to and pay money to have access to. So the clients just have to connect with us and then we'll kind of merge them into it and work with them on it. Um, we also have on our Missouri SBDC page some free uh, online classes. And I believe they're free right now uh, and for the time being. So there's financial management classes and, you know, kind of basic introduction to business management type topics. Uh, so for those that are looking for that, uh, th those are available. Um, does that answer the question, give or take? Yes, sir. I believe people were asking how best to access the resources, how to connect with you. And it's good to know that if we call that number, you might not answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a lot of missed calls every, every day. And, and we try to reach back out to everyone, but obviously just, you know, with the way things are, it's just very challenging. So email is a lot easier and I will get back to everyone uh, within a day or so. And I believe there's also the ability to access online if we click on that COVID banner on the SBDC page that brings us into the resources, but it also gives us the opportunity to connect with a counselor. Yes, so uh, our statewide network has set up a team that are specifically just focused on disaster response. So if you go through that, you'll be connected to that team and they're phenomenal. Uh, so, so that's the starting point if you go through that um, and that's absolutely fine. Thanks, Jacob. Dr. Russell, I believe that we have another question that uh, was in reference to some of the information that you presented about the CDC guidelines for sanitation in the workspace. And I don't recall if I saw the link to uh, where to get those resources or not on your uh, slideshow. Would you just speak to where those resources are available? Sure, yeah, I will put them in the chat here momentarily. Uh, they, they are on the slide deck there too, but let me, I will put them here very quickly. So, I'm oh, sorry, it's OSHA. So one of them I'm putting up right now. And there's the second one. Oops, they are not separating out there, so. Thank you. I will include those links and that information in the materials that I send that are attached to the recording following today's event. As I don't see any additional questions coming in, I want to be sure to thank all of our presenters today and for joining us and taking time out of their schedules to share their expertise and information with us. Uh, we do want you to know that if it's important to you, it's important to us. And so we're holding the webinar series so that we can respond to the needs of employers, businesses, and communities. Uh, we hope that you register for the upcoming webinar that is scheduled for April 29th. And we'll be meeting with, or we'll be hearing from, 
Sherry Toon, uh, Jason Jones, and a couple of their partners in regard to ACT resiliency with the Work Ready Program for Workforce and Business Development. Uh, we will stay on for just a few minutes following the presentation if there are people that have additional questions. Thank you for attending. We're grateful for your attendance and participation. And we look forward to connecting with you uh, as this webinar series continues to move forward. Thank you.